The mood worsened when what looked unmistakably like the start of a chain reaction swept eastwards across Asia. First to go was Iraq. The unification of Egypt and Syria prompted much discussion among the well-educated elite in Baghdad, for whom the attractions of pan-Arabism seemed increasingly tempting as a third way between the attentions of Washington and Moscow. But things turned poisonous in the capital in the summer of 1958, sparked by a dangerous rise in pro-Nasser sympathies and rising anti-Western sentiments laced with aggressive rhetoric about Israel. On the 14th of July, a group of high-ranking Iraqi army officers led by Abdul Karim Qasim, a man nicknamed the Snake Charmer by contemporaries who attended a military course with him in Britain two decades earlier, staged a coup. Marching on the palace at breakfast time, the plotters rounded up leading members of the royal family, including King Faisal II, in the palace courtyard and executed them. The body of Crown Prince Abd al-Ilha, a thoughtful and rather serious man, was dragged into the street like a dog, torn apart and then burnt by an angry mob. The next day, the Iraqi Prime Minister Nuri al-Said, a veteran politician who had witnessed the transformation of the Middle East at first hand, was tracked down as he tried to flee, dressed as a woman, and shot dead. His body was mutilated and gleefully paraded through Baghdad. These events seemed to herald a new certain expansion of the Soviet Union's interests. Iran, the Russian supremo Nikita Khrushchev, told President John F. Kennedy at the summit conference in 1921, would soon drop like a rotten fruit into Soviet's hands, a prospect that seemed likely given that even the head of the Iranian secret police was known to be plotting against the Shah. After Moscow's State Security Committee, better known as the KGB, had failed with one assassination attempt, attention was turned to preparing landed sites and munition dumps across Iran, presumably in anticipation of the decision to escalate efforts to foment a popular uprising and bring down the monarchy. Things looked little better in Iraq, where a senior U.S. Poly policymaker wrote that the country almost surely will drift into what amounts to a communist takeover. One result of this was Western realignment with Nasser, who began to be viewed as the lesser of two evils. The U.S. was at pains to build bridges with the mercurial Egyptian leader, who himself recognized that Arab nationalism could be compromised by what he reportedly referred to as the growing communist penetration of the Middle East. Common cause between Washington and Cairo was underscored by the decision of the new leadership in Iraq to plot a course of its own and steer away from pan-Arabism and from Nasser. This simply raised concerns still further about the specter of the Soviet Union. Plans for dealing with Baghdad were drawn up, with a committee appointed in the U.S. to look at overt or covert means of avoiding a communist takeover in Iraq. Limitations in the source material make it difficult to know how much involvement, if any, the CIA had in an attempted coup to remove Qasim, the nationalist prime minister who had deposed the Iraqi monarchy that was staged towards the end of 1959. One of those involved who grazed his sh uh, shin during the confusion later used his participation to near-mythical effect to show his resolve and personal bravery. His name was Saddam Hussein. Whether the plotters enjoyed U.S. support on this occasion is not certain, although records show that the American intelligence community was aware of the failed push before it took place. The fact that the elaborate plans were developed to remove key figures from positions of authority, such as an unnamed Iraqi uh, colonel, a colonel who was to be sent a monogrammed handkerchief contaminated with an incapacitating agent, also shows the active steps were being taken to try to ensure that Baghdad did not slip into Moscow's orbit. It was perhaps no um, coincidence that when Qasim was finally deposed in 1963, his overthrow came as no surprise to American observers, who later stated that this had been forecast in exact detail by CIA agents. This deep engagement with the situation in Iraq was primarily driven by the desire to keep the Soviet Union out of the countries to its south. Building connections across the belt
that spanned the Silk Roads was partly a matter of political prestige, where the, where the U.S. could not afford to be seen to be losing out to a rival that offered a sharply contrasting vision for the world. But there were other reasons for the intensity of this sustained interest. In 1955, Moscow decided to locate a major testing site for long-range missiles in what is now Kazakhstan, after concluding that the steps provided a perfect environment in which to establish a chain of guidance antennae that would allow launches to be monitored without obstruction during flight, while also being sufficiently isolated as to pose no threat to existing urban centers. This resulting center, named after the Baikonur Cosmodrome, became the primary location for the development and testing of ballistic missiles. Even before the center was established, the Soviets had launched the R-5, which had a range of over 600 miles and was capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. In 1957, its successor, the R-7, better known by its NATO codename, SS-6, Sapwood, came into production with a range of 5,000 miles, dramatically raising the threat posed by the Soviet Union to the west. The launch of Sputnik, the world's first satellite, the following year, along with the introduction of a fleet of Tupolev, Tu-95 Bear, and 3M Bison long-range strategic bombers, bombers focused the minds of American military planners further still. It was vital that the U.S. should be able to monitor missile tests, keeping an eye open for developments in ballistic capabilities as well as possible hostile launches. The Cold War often prompts thought of the Berlin Wall in Eastern Europe as the principal arena for confrontation between the superpowers. But it was the swath of territory within the Soviet Union's underbelly where the real game of Cold War chess was played out. The strategic value up to the U.S. of the countries along the USSR's southern flank had long been recognized. Now they became vitally important. Air bases, listening stations, and communication networks in Pakistan became a crucial part of U.S. defense strategy. By the time the Soviet missile cap capability reached the intercontinental stage, Peshawar, Peshawar Air Station in the north of the country was providing vital intelligence gathering services. It served as a departure point for U-2 spy plane operations that undertook reconnaissance missions over Baikonur, as well as over other major military installations, including the plutonium processing plant at Shelabinsk. It was from Peshawar that Gary Powers took off on the ill-fated mission that saw him shot down in Soviet airspace near Sverdlovsk in 1960 in one of the most gripping incidents of the Cold War. There was no small irony then that the American political and military objectives, which were central to the defense of the free world and the democratic way of life, led to, a very, different, led to very different results. The U.S. position in this part of the world was built on a series of strong men with undemocratic instincts and unsavory methods of staying in power. In the case of Pakistan, the U.S. were happy to deal with General Ayub Khan after he had led a coup in 1958, which he cannily billed as a revolution away from communism in an effort to gain American support. He was able to impose martial law without incurring the opprobrium of his Western backer backers, justifying his actions as being harsh only to those who have been destroying Pakistan's moral fiber. Lip service was paid to the restoration of a workable constitutional government, though few had any illusions that military dictatorship was likely to be long-lasting, especially after Ayub started, stated that it would be some decades before educational standards had been raised sufficiently to trust the population to vote for their leaders. The U.S. was more than happy to provide weapons in large quantities to this dubious ally. Sidewinder missiles, jet fighters, and B-57 tactical bombers were just some of the hardware sold with the approval of President Eisenhower. This had the effect of further building up the status and power of the armed forces in Pakistan, where upwards of 65% of the national budget was spent on the military. It seemed the necessary price to pay to keep friends in power in this part of the world. Laying the basis for social reform was risky and time-consuming compared to the immediate gains to be made from relying on strongmen and the elites that surrounded them. But the result was the stifling of democracy and the laying down of deep-rooted problems that would fester over time. The leadership of Afghanistan was courted equally assiduously with the Prime Minister 
Dawood Khan, for example, invited for a two-week visit to the United States at the end of the 1950s. The desire to make an impression was such that when he landed, he was greeted on the tarmac by both Vice President Nixon and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles before being cordially received by President Eisenhower, who was at pains to warn the Afghan premier of the threat communism posed to the Muslim countries of Asia. The U.S. had already begun a series of ambitious development projects in Afghanistan, such as a major irrigation scheme in the Helmand Valley and a bold effort to improve the education system. It now gave further commitments in order to counterbalance substantial Soviet investments, loans, and infrastructure projects that were already in operation. The problem, of course, was that it did not take long for leaders in the countries concerned to realize that they could play the two superpowers off against each other and extract increasingly large benefits from both as a result. Indeed, when President, President Eisenhower visited Kabul in person at the end of the 1950s, he was asked point-blank to match the aid that was being given to his country by Moscow. Refusal had consequences, but so did acquiescence. American planners became highly agitated, meanwhile, about what was seen as a distinct wobble in Iran at the end of the 1950s when Shah Reza Pahlavi demonstrated a willingness to improve relations with Moscow following a damaging campaign of radio propaganda funded by the Soviet Union, which relentlessly played on the image of the Iranian ruler as a puppet of the West and urged the work workers to rise up and overthrow his despotic regime. It was enough to make the Shah consider abandoning what he called Iran's totally antagonistic relations with the USSR and open up more conciliatory channels of communication and cooperation. This set off alarm bells in Washington, where strategists look, took an uncompromising view of Iran's pivotal importance on the Soviet Union's southern flank. By the start of the 1960s, as one report put it, the country's strategic location between the USSR and the Persian Gulf and its great oil reserves make it critically important to the United States that Iran's friendship, independence, and territorial integrity be maintained. Considerable energy and resources went into supporting Iran's economy and its military and to reinforcing the Shah's control over the country. It was considered so important to keep the Shah happy that a blind eye was turned to intolerance and to large-scale corruption and the inevitable economic stagnation this helped to cause. Nothing was said and done about persecution of religious minorities such as the Baha'i, who were singled out for the brutal treatment in 19, the 1950s. There was precious little to show, meanwhile, for the st steep increase in Iran's oil revenues, which had multiplied more than sevenfold between 1954 and 1960. The Shah's relatives and the group informally referred to in Iran as the 1,000 families established an iron grip on imports, making fortunes for themselves as they did so. Soft loans given by Washington simply served to line the pockets of the few at the expense of the poor who found it difficult to keep up with the soaring cost of living, especially following a bad harvest in 1959 and 1960. It did not help that some U.S. projects that were designed to stimulate the agrarian economy were spectacular failures. Attempts to replace traditional seeds with modern hybrids were a disaster, with the new strains proving unsuitable for the terrain and lacking resistance to disease and insect devastation. A scheme designed to help both Iranian and American poultry farmers by introducing U.S. chicks to Iran had calamitous results as well, with the unavailability of suitable feed and the lack of vaccination having consequences that were all too predictable. The embarrassing failure to understand how the water table in Iran worked led to wells that drained underground reservoirs and it destroyed the viability of many farms across the country. Counterproductive schemes such as these were hardly positive examples of the benefits of closer cooperation with the West and with the U.S. in particular. They also provided fertile ground for critis critics to exploit. None was more adept at doing so than a Shia scholar Ruhala Musavi Khomeini, who caught the mood of a population that was increasingly dis disgruntled by low rages the lack of economic progress, and the conspicuous absence of social justice. Your Excellency, Mr. Shah, let me give you a piece of advice. The Ayatollah declared in, in one particularly fiery speech in the early 1960s, You miserable wretch, is it time for you to think and reflect a little and ponder where all of this is leading you?
Mr. Shah, do you want me to say that you don't believe in Islam and kick you out of Iran? It was enough to get him arrested upon which riots broke out in the center of Tehran with crowds chanting Khomeini or death. As CIA intelligence reports noted, even government employees joined demonstrations against the regime. Rather than heading the war heeding the warnings, the Shah responded by antagonizing his critics still further. The clergy of Iran, he announced with an astonishing lack of tact on a visit to the holy city of Qom, where ignorant and withered men whose minds have not been stirred in centuries. And instead of offering concessions or instigating wholehearted reforms, energy was focused on tightening controls. Khomeini was forced into exile, settling for more than a decade in Najaf, in neighboring Iraq, where his passionate denunciations of the Shah and his regime were not just welcomed but positively encouraged. Substantial resources were also spent building up the Savak, the Iranian secret police force, which quickly developed a fearsome reputation. Imprisonment without trial, torture, and execution were used on a large scale to deal with critics of the Shah and those close to him. In a few rare cases, fortunate opponents whose high profile kept them visible, like Khomeini, were placed under house arrest and exiled to remove them from the scene. The use of such tactics in the Soviet Union was the subject of vocal criticism by the U.S., denounced as the antithesis of democracy and a tool of totalitarianism in Iran. It was passed over in silence. To maintain the support of the Shah and cement his position, funds continued to pour into Iran from Washington, building a 1,500-mile highway system linking the Persian Gulf with the Caspian Sea, helping the construction of a major deep water port at Bandar Abbas, allowing the power grid to be expanded and upgraded, and even providing capital to be set up prestige projects, such as the creation of a national airline. Throughout the process, most Western policymakers ignored the realities on the ground, choosing to see only what they wanted to see. To many U.S. observers, Iran seemed to be an unmitigated triumph. The economy of one of the, one of the United States' staunchest friends in the Middle East was surging forward, stated a report prepared for President Johnson in 1968. Iran's GNP, or Gross National Product, was rising so quickly that it was one of the notable success stories of recent times. The same conclusion was reached even more emphatically for four years later. Following the end of the Second World War, the American embassy in Tehran noted the United States has been forced to take a gamble on Iran and shape the country after its own image. That gamble has paid off handsomely, probably more so than in any other developing country which has benefited from similar U.S. investment. Iran was on track, the report confidently predicted, to become the most prosperous country in Asia after Japan, and on a par with many countries in Europe. Those who were more skeptical, however, were in a distinct minority. One such was the young academic William Polk, who had been called in by the Kennedy administration to advise on foreign affairs. There would be violence and even revolution if the Shah did not reform the political process, he warned, when that unrest broke out, it would only be a matter of time before the security forces would refuse to fire on protesters. Opposition to the Shah was now uniting under the powerful Islamic institution of Iran. Polk was exactly right. At the time, however, it seemed more important to continue shoring up an ally against communism than to press him to loosen his grip on power. And the Shah developed increasingly grandiose plans that made matters even worse. Vast amounts were invested in the military, with Iran's military spending rising from $293 million in 1963 to $7.3 billion less than 15 years later. As a result, the country's air force and army became among the largest in the world. Iran funded this extraordinary escalation thanks in part to military aid and soft loans from the U.S., which profited in turn because much of the hardware was brought from American defense contractors. However, Iran also benefited from the continuing rise in oil revenues and from the mechanism that had been set up by the world's leading producers to act as a cartel, and in doing so, maximize returns. The creation of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, OPEC, in 1960 was designed to coordinate the release of oil supplies on the open market. The aim was to allow the founder members, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Venezuela, again, that OPEC, uh, 
the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Venezuela, to combine their interests and boost their incomes by controlling supply and therefore controlling prices. It was the logical next step for resource-rich countries, which had an eye on wresting power away from the Western corporations while receiving political and financial backing from Western governments. OPEC, or OPEC, effectively marked a deliberate attempt to curtail the influence of the West, whose interests in providing cheap and plentiful fuel for its domestic markets were distinctly different to those of the countries that were rich in deposits of oil and gas and who were keen for the revenues they brought in to be as high as possible. Again, this was, this, this, this was the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Unlikely, it seems, therefore, OPEC was the spiritual protege of an already unlikely cast of characters made up of defiant leaders like Mossadegh, the populist demagogue Nasser, the hardliner Qasim, and increasingly anti-Western figures in Iran typified by the Ayatollah Khomeini. All were linked by their concerted attempts to detach their states from overpowering outside attention. OPEC was not a political movement, but aligning a range of countries and enabling them to talk and act with a single voice was a key step in the process of transferring political power away from Europe and the U.S. to local governments. The sheer abundance of oil in Iran, Iraq, Ku Kuwait, and Saudi combined with the rising global demand meant that the mid-20th century was marked by a fundamental rebalancing of power. The extent of this began to become clear in 1967 when Nasser launched a surprise attack on Israel. Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Kuwait, supported by Algeria and Libya, two countries in North Africa where, produ where production was taking off, suspended shipments to Britain and the United States as a result of their perceived friendliness to Israel. With refineries being shut down and pipelines closed, a nightmare scenario loomed large, with the prospect of substantial shortfalls, sharp price rises, and a threat to the global economy. As it happened, the impact was minimal because Nasser's assault failed on the battlefield, but above all, because it failed quickly. The Six-Day War was over almost as soon as it began, and Nasser and dreams of Arab nationalism were delivered a reality check. The Israeli military, backed by Western technology and political support, proved to be a formidable adversary. Neither the West nor its supposed puppet state in the Middle East was ready to suffer a decisive blow just yet. For two centuries, the great powers of Europe had struggled and fought each other for control of the region and of the markets that linked the Mediterranean with India and China. The 20th century saw the recoil of Western Europe's position and the passing of the baton on to the United States. In some ways, it was entirely appropriate that it was a nation forged from the competition between Britain, France, and Spain that took up the mantle of trying to maintain control over the heart of the world. It would prove to be a tough challenge not least since a new great game was about to begin.